we're back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I'm Sean. And this is Jamie Dunlop. Jamie Dunlop, can you start us off with prayer, brother? I'd love to. Thank you. Well, Father in heaven, thank you for uh, the opportunity we have to sit down and talk about these things today. We do ask that you would use this conversation to edify and to encourage, to exhort where necessary. Uh, Father, we thank you for the friendship that Sean and I have. Thank you for the brotherhood we share in Christ. Mm. Uh, We thank you for uh, what you paid that we could be together. And Father, uh, we ask that you would give us opportunity to enjoy the conversation together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Jamie, give us the, uh, us being our listeners and viewers, uh, just maybe a two-minute testimony. How did you come to know the Lord? Sure. Uh, My great-grandfather came to Christ uh, listening to a street preacher when he was 14 years old, and he raised Mm. my grandfather to be a Christian, and he raised my father in a Christian home, and my parents are both solid Christians. I remember first putting the pieces of the gospel together when I was four years old. Mm. Like, I realized, oh, I'm a sinner, and Jesus died for my sin, but I need to invite him into my heart. And I got stuck there because I had no idea what it means to invite him into my heart. Right. But eventually, I kind of pieced things together. When I was 14, I can look at my life and I can see things I was doing I can't explain except for God's spirit being at work in me. Mm-hmm. Like sharing the gospel with people who I was terrified to share the gospel with. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally building friendships at all. I was extraordinarily introverted, but realized God loves people. I should love them too. And so sometime between four and 14, uh, the Lord saved me. Okay. And so now you are the... So an associate pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. And I've been in that role for about 15 years at the church for most of the last 25. Yeah. What What did you do before that? I was in business. Yeah. Can you elaborate? Uh, I or worked what, for a, it boring. Uh, I found it fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So did a few years uh, working for a consulting firm, mainly doing uh, work with private equity. So buying and selling companies. Yeah. And then I took a year to be Mark Devers assistant at my church to figure out if I should be a pastor. Mm. My decision was no, I have no business being a pastor. So I went back into business, went to another firm doing similar work for seven years and eventually came around to being a pastor. And so I... How did that happen? How did you go from definitely not to definitely uh, yes? I, uh, I grew and matured. So I, I had been interested in being a pastor really since the summer of my... When I was 21, I rode cross country on my bicycle with a friend of mine. We were both Christians. We started... Uh, sleeping in church basements Mm. just because the weather was really bad. It was either really rainy or really hot. So we'd knock on the door of a church every night, (laughs) meet a different pastor every night. They were super nice. So we very often, we'd just, you know, show up and sleep in some random stranger's home and they'd feed us lots of food and stuff. But as a result, I met all these pastors, just kind of small town, middle of America. And I was uh, deeply uh, disturbed by what I saw. So most of them, when I would inquire about what they believed, gave me a gospel of works, not of grace. Mm. Uh, I think uh, many of them were lazy. So I remember the guy who said, look, I love being a pastor. I work for an hour a week. I do a half hour sermon prep. I show up halfway through the sermon to preach my sermon. I fish the rest of the time. Uh. And I remember this long ride, 100. So this is a longer answer to your question. No, I, I love it, brother. 140 miles one day through Kansas, Kansas just thinking about that pastor I'd spent the previous evening with and thinking, gosh, maybe I should be a pastor just because I have a pulse and I can share the gospel. Mm. And that makes me better than most of these people I'm meeting. And it just, it broke my heart that I was in these churches of people who they, they wanted Jesus and yet they were being given something which was anything but. Yeah. And I just thought, I just want to, I want to help one of these churches. So I, finished the ride, moved to Washington, D.C., and immediately began thinking about, should I quit my job and just go to seminary and find a church in the middle of nowhere and be their pastor? Yeah. And my new pastor, Mark Dever, uh, had lunch with me. I told him this. He said, that's not your decision. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'll let you know if you should go to seminary. You just need to be a faithful member of the church. So he was controlling. Uh, If you, well, you know him. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, <laughs> but very opinionated. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, so I worked uh, in business for a few years, and then he said, well, hey, I know you think about being a pastor. Why don't you come be my assistant for a year? So I did that for a year. Yeah. And basically over the course of the year, realized I'm good at stuff pastors don't need to do yeah. business. I'm not good at stuff pastors need to be good at. Namely, I was still very introverted. We did not have good people skills. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, maybe I should be a missionary. But then had some health issues, realized missions wasn't a good thing. And so for a decided, good thing for you, yeah. Yeah, just decided, oh, just we'll stay on Capitol Hill. But then I was married. And I was serving as one of the non-staff elders of the church and was very content with that. And then uh, the church was growing, changing. We had started Nine Marks, started Together for the Gospel, started some other things. And we're realizing we needed someone who could kind of be the chief operating officer for the church, someone yeah. who had the heart of a pastor, brains of a business person. I was not the first person to come to mind. Oh. Uh, we had someone else in mind. I wrote the job description. That person didn't work out. As I wrote the job description, I realized, gosh, I'd always told myself that I was a bad fit with being a pastor. But I think I'm actually a really good fit with this particular job. Yeah. I had been married for a while. My wife had rubbed off those rough edges. Mm. I had been in business, learning to be a manager. I think that was building my people skills. I'd been an elder. So I was changing and the church's needs were changing and I think it was a really good fit. So yeah. 15 years ago, I had lunch with Mark Dever and I said, look, the elders have been talking about being this new pastor position, filling a new pastor position. And I think I'm, I'm interested. And I kind of expected him to be like, oh, that's great. And he said, well, if you really have to. <laughs> I was like, what, what was that? What? Yeah. And he said, look, you are serving as a non-staff elder. You can afford to live in the neighborhood. Your job doesn't work crazy hours. And so you can be super fruitful and be here for a long time. And I don't have many people like you. So if you have to become a pastor, that's great. I'm sure you do a great job, but only if you have to, because I can hire staff. I can't just hire non-staff elders like you. So that made me pause. I thought about it, prayed about it some more. And uh, I thought, no, I think, I think this is what I'm built to do. Yeah. And so I said, Mark, I'm, I think I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. And then he said, oh, good. <laughs> well, brother, the Lord um, has certainly, not trying to embarrass you, but the Lord has certainly blessed that decision. I've been the recipient of it on at least two different occasions. And it is a very rare thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a unique combination of gifts. Um, at the end of my year as Mark's assistant, we sat down and he said, you have the most bizarre set of gifts. I have no idea what to do with you. Yeah. So well, you yes, you say way. unique, he says bizarre. Yeah, whatever. It's different. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's the interesting. word. That's the adjective we use when we don't want to say something unkind. Right. When something. the doctor says, you have a very interesting case. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, what, are you, I mean, I know you guys don't use titles like executive pastor, but that's would you what say my that, title would be if I was at a church that used that, that use title. I don't like that title because it's the congregation's role to execute ministry, mm -hmm. right? It's not my job. I'm not the, I'm there to fuel them, to help them so they can execute ministry. Yeah. That's why I don't like the title. If you're listening or watching, you have that title, but no, no judgment on you. I just, I feel like it works against what I'm trying to do as a church. Sure, yeah. Well, we didn't bring you here to talk about executive pastor stuff, although I'm glad we had that little segue. Uh, you have a new book coming out in November. I do. Of this year. What's it called? Love the Ones Who Drive You Crazy. That's such a good title. Did you come up with that? I did. Love the Ones That Drive You Crazy. Uh, I read it in preparation for this interview. It, it was fantastic. It was um, an appropriate length, right? Good. It was uh, fun in certain places. It was weighty in other places. It was an easy read. It was a needed read. It was full of good illustrations from real life ministry difficulties. Uh, having said that, uh, why don't you tell us what the book is about and, and how the desire to write it came to came about as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I just met with a bunch of pastors mm -hmm. and I told them the book was a biography of my friendship with you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> And we all laughed. No, nah, we time. did because we know it's funny and silly. Um, and partly true. Well, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the book is about the fact that if you're a Christian, 
And if you're in a church which is centered on Christ alone, mm -hmm. then you're going to find you're there with people who are radically different from you in all kinds of ways. And yeah. that's really hard. Yeah. And yet it is, it is the fact that you can build a friendship based on Christ alone that glorifies Christ. Yeah. And so sometimes the thing that makes us feel like things have gone terribly wrong like how on earth have I found myself in church with that person uh -huh. with, you know, their social media feed and that person and what they believe about whatever. And that person who I just, I cannot understand them based on their background. Because actually this is what the church is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a book about how to do that. I wrote a book a while ago with Mark Dever called the compelling community mm -hmm. where I, I was pointing out that, um, we often try to make a church attractive through our programs and our music and such. But in the scriptures, what we see is that a church should be attractive because of God's work in it. Yeah. Uh, it's God's supernatural work of regeneration and the good works that come out of that that show off who he is. Yeah. And I, I uh, made the case that there are really two aspects of a church community that show off the work of God, the depth of commitment we have for each other, we're the new household of God, mm -hmm. and the breadth of commitment we have to each other. That, you know, the book of Ephesians, it's the, the people who are the new household of God are Jew and Gentile, the natural enemies. Mm -hmm. And I've right. had so many people over the years who have said, how do we do that? Like if I'm in a church with people who are would be enemies, you know, I'm a Jew, they're a Gentile, how do I build friendship? Yeah. And so for, for some years, I thought, yeah, it'd be a good book to write someday. I don't think I have the answer. <coughs> and then uh, I watched my church go through 2020, 2021, which I think for most pastors was a difficult time Yeah. because you had a whole bunch of people who were all getting along together. And then suddenly you have questions about, uh, do you join the protests in your city or not? Mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, speak about, uh, you know, the president elect or not? Uh, do you wear masks or not? Mm -hmm. all, all kinds of stuff that, um, that at least my church hadn't dealt with in that, we hadn't dealt with that level of disagreement before. And I was making decisions, particularly as the, the executive pastor about, uh, where our church is meeting, we had to sue the government mm -hmm. to be able to meet outdoors in DC during the pandemic. And that was a, a, a fairly unified decision. I think 92% of the church voted in favor of the lawsuit, but it did not feel that way sure. because we had lots of really good concerns on both sides of that question. We had questions about, should we comply with the law? When should we not comply? Uh, some people felt like we were being too aggressive in some places or too timid in other places on all kinds of different issues. And keep in mind, there's a church on Capitol Hill. People are very political. Uh, there are all kinds of shades of gray in terms of different political camps. Mm -hmm. I had people upset with me. I was upset with people. I was in lots of conversations with people where we disagreed. Up to your eyeballs in conversations. Yes, and it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was terrible because I was thinking sinfully about it, or they were thinking sinfully, or both of us. Sometimes it was terrible because we just had different opinions, and yet I kept coming back from these conversations realizing, okay, I don't agree with them, but I see them acting like a Christian. Mm. At the same time, I was trying to memorize through the book of Romans, and I was memorizing Romans 12, Romans 13, Romans 14, Romans mm. 15, and I kept kind of mapping in my head what I was seeing in my congregation, what that I was seeing in the book of Romans. And I was, oh, you know, Paul's writing to a group of churches who also have a wild set of disagreements going on, right? We've got Jew and Gentile together in the same churches. And they're disagreeing over all kinds of stuff, let alone all the differences of background uh, and upbringing that they're dealing with. And there are some very practical tools he's given to us in these chapters on what it looks like to build real affectionate friendships with people where we honestly don't share much in common other than Christ. Yeah. So that was the that was the genesis of the book. The stuff I learned from my congregation mapped onto the book of Romans, those last few chapters, just put into book form. 
Well, I'm really glad that you got to go through that. <laughs> well, I'm so sure that we you did too. I mean, did. every yeah. church was doing it yeah. in their own way. I wasn't memorizing Romans 12 through 15 at the time that I was going through it, though. Well, that maybe it would have helped. Really useful. Did you, <laughs> did, you, did you finish it? Did you memorize the entire book? I did, and my wife had my kids dress up as Roman soldiers and togas to celebrate. Oh, yes. man. that's so, Do you have a picture of that? No, of course <sighs> not. Gosh, okay. Uh, can you just from beginning to end recite the book of Romans for us? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I will say I've done this with a few different books. It mm -hmm. doesn't stick. It doesn't, yeah. but it's still useful. So useful. Yeah. So I just say, I just need to be realistic. Like, okay, I'm going to memorize the book of the Bible. I'm probably not going to be able to recite it two years from now, yeah. but boy, I'm going to get to know it really well right now. Yeah. Start, start with Jude, you know, there start, you go. And then yes. work your way up. Yes. Do you know who Jim Oric is? Never heard of him. He was a professor at Boyce. Uh huh. Uh, he's memorized Revelation, John, Matthew, Romans, the Psalms, wow. all of the Psalms. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. And he can probably still recite them, can't he? He says that like, for example, Revelation, he's like, I, I, I have like 60% of it, but if you give me a month, I'll be back at 100%. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where does one find the time, you know? So, uh, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, this was my, that, that and learning Hebrew. That was my, my two pandemic projects together, but not at the same time. Yes. At the same time. Wow. Very, <laughs> yes, obviously. Duh. Lots of time no, on your hands, right? Yeah. Well, not for me. The pandemic didn't really happen down here in Alabama. So <laughs> <laughs> at least we, we didn't notice it. Yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, let's go back to the me, you thing, because yeah. it is interesting that we're, that we are friends. We don't vacation together, but we're friends. And, uh, it is interesting that we're having this conversation because I think for the first Mm, like eight years of knowing you, I was pretty sure you just didn't like me. Do you mm. remember me talking to you about that? Yes, I do. Yeah. I came to you super embarrassed, but thought there's the only way it's going to get better is if I expose my uh, <laughs> insecurities mm. to you. And I was just like, I don't know why, Jamie. I just feel like you don't like me. And I think that that was just owing to the fact that we are radically different people. You went to Princeton. I don't have a high school diploma, mm. right? You were in business. My only business experience was selling crystal meth. Um, uh, you probably made a lot more money than I did. <laughs> right. I have tattoos. You only have one on your lower back. No, you don't have. <laughs> you don't have. <laughs> you don't have any tattoos. Or let just, the record be clear, John. Record. John does not know that. No tramp stamp. Uh, even our dispositions. I am an off the charts extrovert. And you, I'm way more introverted than people realize. Yeah, yes. which and I think. Well, I so I appreciate your. It's it's a very humble and vulnerable thing to come to someone and say, "Do you have something against me?" Yeah, and, and to be clear, you had never done or said anything that sh it was my insecurity. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyways, go ahead. Oh, I say Jesus tells us to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you were just obeying scripture. Yeah, but I think I think it's important for people to understand that this book isn't only born from uh, like you've been through this a lot, like a lot, mm. a lot. And as I was reading it, I was thinking about our experience, and I was mm. thinking like, oh yeah, this is what happened with us. Even my my tenure at CHBC, um, you know, so I. I uh, I got saved. We have a lot more tattoos now than when you were there. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, it's trendy now. Yeah, well. You were before it was fashionable. Uh, you're darn right. <laughs> before it was cool. Um, so I got saved. I tried to go to church here locally. Mm. But when you're a drug dealer one day and then you go into a Southern Baptist church the next day, it's it's scary for people. It's like the right. Apostle Paul. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this like, is the get him out of here. Him Don't out you know who here. this guy is? Uh, and then uh, I joined the military. I ended up going to Mars Hill, which felt a little more comfortable. The Lord moved me away from there after a year. I went to a church. I, I won't name it, but I thought this was like, I thought this was like the promised land, mm. like a church where we look alike and talk alike and dress alike and we like the same kind of music and doctrinally we're all aligned. This is going to be. Uh, this is it, right? And, you know, six or seven months in, I was like, this is actually not that fulfilling. Something something is strangely unsatisfying mm. about this church experience. Mm. And then in the Lord's providence, I got stationed in Washington, D.C., and I went to Capitol Hill because I was like, oh, that's that guy who wrote that book about healthy churches. I'll go check out his healthy church. And two weeks in, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, you know, 10 hymns, 
I've never heard of any of these. I can barely sing them. The preaching was like an hour 20, right? And I didn't have the depth in That's me. That's an to exaggeration. It. No, no, no. It was an hour 25. No, it's not. Uh. It. But uh, I didn't have the depth in me to appreciate the sermons. And this was back when Mark still wore a suit and tie. My first Sunday there, I was wearing a, a an A-frame. I still had gold teeth with vampire fangs. I remember those. And, yeah. uh, and so... I think it was like our third Sunday. I was just like, I was told Amber on the way out. I was like, I'm not, I'm, we're not coming back. This is too mm. hard. Garrett Kell grabbed me and convinced me to stick around. And slowly but surely, I began to understand what is now your book, right? Like, uh, why is that? Why is he? Why is he wearing penny loafers? That drives me crazy, right? But then I got to know this dude, and I was like, oh, he loves the Lord mm. a lot, mm. you know. And so our relationship is kind of like a microcosm for what I experienced in general at CHBC. So uh, all that to say, this book is born of uh, yeah, real practical fruit. Well, one thing I talk about in the book is that Christ is worth more than comfort. Okay, and that's exactly what you were discovering. This church was crazy uncomfortable, but you saw Christ here. Yeah. And so you stuck around. Yeah. And the, in some senses, Sean, I've not written the book for you. I've written the book for the 95% of the people in that church for whom church is very comfortable. Right. Because they share the same background as everybody else and they share the, sh say, share the same assumptions as everybody else. Yeah. And uh, they, in that sense, don't need to act like a Christian to walk into church. Whereas you very much had to act like a Christian. What, you do, you, to, what do you mean act like a Christian? To believe that Christ is worth more than okay. comfort. Yeah to say, I want him, even though this is terribly uncomfortable and it's worth it. I'm writing the book for all those other people who need to act the same way, even though they're not challenged in the same way simply to show up at church. Yeah. So in, in the book, I tell the story about um, a, a brother who's now in South Africa who was transferred to Australia. He had grown up in a Zionist church. Mm. And uh, it was a works-oriented church, no gospel, at least where he was at, but very focused on performance and presentation. So he said that Zionist church, he would start preparing his church uniform on Friday Oof. to be ready to show up on Sunday. Yeah, Moves to Australia because he's transferred by his, his company. And there's a neighborhood church. It's a Presbyterian church. So he walks in. And he said he almost walked out the moment he came in because he, mm. he's the only black person there. He was already a little fed up with the fascination with him as a black person mm -hmm. in this particular part of Australia in that particular time of, of uh, I think it was the early 80s. Yeah. And the pastor's wearing flip-flops and an untucked shirt. Yeah. And he's like, this is nuts. Which I would agree with them, but the, anyways. The pastor's preaching through the Ten Commandments. And being good Presbyterians, he's, he's just giving us the larger catechism and how the Ten Commandments reveal Christ and the moral law of God. And, and he's like, I'd, I'd never heard this before. Particularly, I'd, I'd never heard that Jesus obeyed for me, that my righteousness is not my own. It's, it's a righteousness from Christ because Christ obeyed the law. And uh, so he, he, he talked to his wife. He said, we, we got to go back there again. So he said it was, it was terribly uncomfortable, but he was hearing Jesus there. And so he just kept coming. Yeah. And, um, Sorry, and one that, of my, that reminds me of Jesus. And I think it's John 10, my sheep hear my voice. Yes. Right? It's like, I just, I hear the voice of my master. Here. And I want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and my point in the book is that... Um, He's a wonderful example for us. But all of us need to act that way. Mm -hmm. um, all of us need to make the very costly gamble that Christ is worth more than comfort. And that may not mean as an African uh, Zionist walking into an Australian Presbyterian church. That may mean as me in the church where I'm very much like everybody else, deciding, you know what, it's very uncomfortable, but I'm going to, I'm going to continue to love this particular person, mm -hmm. even though the friendship makes me uncomfortable because I know we share Christ together. Yeah. And I know that Christ is worth more than me being comfortable. Yeah. I, I'm really struck in Romans 12. It's interesting. If you look at how Paul uses the body of Christ imagery in 1 Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, he does it with a different kind of purpose in each place. 
in, in Romans, his point is that um, though we are all different, the members do not all have the same function. Nonetheless, we are individually members one of another. Right. And I've always been struck. Isn't shouldn't he say we're individually members of Christ? Because mm -hmm. that's true. Which is true, yeah. but that's not his point there. Right. His point is we belong to one another. And I think we we need to see that as a as a promise, an invitation. Mm -hmm. Right? Not not scolding, like you better act like family. Yeah, come on, you're yeah. You 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 are family. Yeah. And if you persevere in loving this person, you're going to discover something there. Like you did with me. Yeah. Uh, over many years, you persevered. You had that humble, vulnerable conversation. And I'd say we have a sweet friendship that's maybe especially sweet because we don't share much in common other than yeah. Christ. Right. And, yeah. and the I would say the main thread running from the beginning of your book to the end is that when you have, when you press into those kinds of relationships, God is maximally glorified, mm. right? So your point isn't merely that God is glorified when we love people that are difficult to love, right? It's that God is maximally glorified. Can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, you think about it in the, in the book of Ephesians. What is it about the Ephesian church that makes even the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms stare in wonder at the wisdom of God? Mm -hmm. It's not just that they love each other. So that's important. Jesus sure. said, well, no, you're my disciples if you love one another. Mm -hmm. It's that it's Jew and Gentile doing what Jesus said. It's, it's these natural enemies mm -hmm. who are living as the household of God. That's what makes the spiritual world just astounded at who God is. Yeah. I think the, the verse that really struck me that kind of the whole book is built around is there in Romans 15, where Paul has been writing to Jew and Gentile, and he's been writing about loving each other. And he's been writing about how they should love each other despite their differences of conviction in Romans 14. And then he gives us this prayer. He says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. Differences in culture, yes. Differences of conviction, yes. These Jew-Gentile churches, and yet when they are determined that being in accord with Christ Jesus is all they need to live in harmony with mm -hmm. one another, it says God gets great glory. Yeah. Uh, and it says so twice that um, just as there is more glory in redemption than in creation alone, there is more glory to God in my church if we love each other despite our differences than if we were all the same to begin with. Can, can you break that down a little bit? More, more glory in redemption than creation, therefore... Yeah, I mean, God does everything for his glory. Right. Uh, God created for his glory. The heavens and the earth. The heavens oh, yeah. and the earth, everything, yeah. Yeah. right? That world fell into sin. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, God began his plan of redemption to bring his people back to him. If, if we had only ever seen creation, we would be able to glory God, glory in God for his power. Uh-huh. His wisdom, yep. uh, his, his might, but we would not have known his mercy. Mm -hmm. We would not have known his kindness in the same way. We would not have known his patience. There are ways in which the story of redemption reveals the, the beauty of who God is in a way that we just can't tell from creation. Yeah. I think in a very similar way, there's, there's a way that, um, that a, a church that's full of differences and yet is united in Christ shows off the power of the gospel in a way that a church where everything's really easy all the time and we're yeah. at peace without trying, it just, it, it can't do. Is that a myth? Does, does a church like that even exist? In one sense, it's a myth. You know, uh, it's, it's a myth to suggest that in any church, we only share Christ in common. Okay. Every church has its own culture. Every church has its own majority. Uh, and there's something wrong with that, right? right? So there's nothing wrong with me having friendships with people in my church who have similar background. In fact, those are really useful because mm -hmm. they can probably point out sin faster. Uh, they can encourage me in very meaningful ways. So I think it's, it's a myth to say the church is built around Jesus alone. No, there's all kinds of similarity that works in there. Some people may experience more than others. 
Okay. But the, what's not a myth is that churches can be made of people who share things that are similar, but also people who don't share much at all. Yeah. And it's not a myth to say that churches can be composed of people who outside of Christ would never be friends, right. might even be enemies, but they are brought together in Christ because that's what Christ does. So we're not saying that a church has to be composed of like 90%. Uh, I don't even think that's even possible to have the majority of the church be vastly dissimilar from one another. No, and I think that myth is actually even dangerous mm. uh, because, you know, I probably fit well with the majority of my church. Yeah. And if I began to think about the church the way you just described that myth, then I think I may discount the difficulty that somebody who doesn't fit in is facing when they walk into my church. Right. Like Sibo did when he walked into that church in Australia. Yeah. If they were like, oh, we don't have a majority culture. Oh, we don't have uh, kind of any norms here. We're open to everybody. Uh, then I think that they're not positioned well to recognize the sacrifices he makes to walk in the door. Oh, yeah. So if you don't have a majority culture or something like that, then it doesn't shine as bright. Or if you when, pretend you don't have a majority right, culture. I right, would say right. every church has a majority culture yeah. in some way, shape, or form. Some are stronger than others. Very true. Yeah. Uh, brother, I have like a lot of notes from your book. It's one of those books, especially the introduction. Uh, if you're like a, if you're really busy and you're like, I don't know if I can read this whole book. First especially of all, the first chapter. I mean, the intro in chapter one, I was highlighting all of it. Um, but you say in the beginning that each chapter in the book examines um, uh, uh, like a different truth in relation to someone who's difficult to love. Can you walk us through some of those? Sure. I think sometimes we're looking at a friendship at church and thinking, there's no reason I can't be at church with this person. Boy, is it difficult. Yeah. And it can be even frustrating. Like, what's wrong with my heart mm. that I keep judging them, that I keep presuming their motives, that I keep getting angry with them, that I don't want to be? What, what's wrong with me? But you, you have to know that that's a very mature way to look at that. That's not how the vast majority of people are going to. Well, they're they're going to say, what's, what's wrong, wrong with them? them? <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. What's wrong with them that I get so angry when I'm around them? <laughs> you got it. Yeah. So, so I... Uh, you're like, okay, what, what's going to change my outlook on this relationship? I think so often you just need a different way to look at it. And if you try a few different perspectives, eventually one's going to click. And okay. so basically I just walk you through eight different perspectives you can use from Romans 12, 14, and 15 to hopefully make something click in your mind where you realize, like you and I did with that conversation we had, oh, I, or the guy with the penny loafers, yeah. I'm seeing things differently now. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll walk through. Uh, and each one begins with a question. Uh, so why did God put difficult people in my church? Mm. I mean, that's what we just talked about in Romans 15, yeah. uh, six and seven. It's that our insistence on unity displays the glory of God. And so very often I look at the difficult people in my church or what I perceive as the difficult people. And I just think this would be so much easier if they weren't there. Yeah. And I just remember, uh, nope. God's doing something here. I can trust him. Yeah, that's so helpful, brother. We, we had... Um, Are you going to let me get through all eight? Well, no, we're going to take it piecemeal. Okay, Piecemeal, good. one at a time. Good. We had a family in our church that uh, they were really feeling that. They were mm. really feeling it. And my encouragement to, to this family was like, hey, God has you here for a reason. Yeah. And I, that, which is why I appreciate the way you framed it, right? It's not how did we happen to be in the same church together? It's like, no. Uh, Why did God, God put, put us, us together? Here? Yeah. Yes. You think differently than the majority of our church about masks, right? You're not here by accident. There's something about you being here, whatever. We're not mask people. You are a mask person. There's something about you being here that's going to sanctify you through this process. Mm. And that's going to sanctify us through this process. So praise God that we're in the same place. Yeah. Right. Cause brother, we also saw there's a, a church that shall not be named, uh, where they kind of came, they planted in the very early days of the pandemic. And then they, they, I mean, they just exploded because they, they were like, we're the church that doesn't do masks. Mm. And we're the church that says the vaccine is a conspiracy. And we're the church that says everyone has to be homeschooled. And they built their entire church identity around those similarities. Um, and it's just, it's just robbing their people of an opportunity to learn how to love each other, to glorify God through that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like if in Rome, 
Uh, they had a Jewish church over here and a Gentile church over here. Yeah. Yeah. You a lot easier. So much easier. Yeah. And yet, oh, look what you lose. You, you do a thought experiment in chapter one where you talk about this pastor who has this issue in the congregation and some people come to him and he's like, listen, you're free to go be, have this other church where you guys all agree on it. But is that going to be the best thing, mm. right? Because that's what we're aiming for, right? We're not merely asking the question, what are people free in Christ to do? We're asking what will be the most glorifying thing to do. Yeah. Well, and not a thought experiment. That's a real story. Oh, I thought, oh, well, no, not hypothetical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah where, um, yeah, there's a, a couple who's just really struggling that the pastor was not willing to call out people in their church who they felt were in the wrong. Yeah. And he just said, look, you know, I'm just preaching the Bible and I'm trying to hold this church together. And that means I'm not going to speak as clearly as you would like me to. And you are welcome to go to any number of churches in town yeah. where the pastor's doing exactly what you want. Yeah. And I just follow kind of what happens in their hearts as they contemplate really uh, going to a, an easier church for that reason. Where the pastor will sound the notes that they want to be sounded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was, it, it felt like I was reading a scenario that I've been in a hundred times as mm. a pastor. You, you're trying to maintain this difficult balance where you're like, hey, we're not a cult. You, you, you know, a covenant is a serious thing, but you are free to leave. And I'll, also, I want you to know that I don't want you to leave, right? It, it's, it's a tricky balance. You're free to leave, but I don't want you to leave because I think it'll be good for you to stay. It'd be good for us if you stayed. You know, it's really, it's really hard. And yet if you decide to leave, you deal with my blessing. Yeah. I, I love yeah. you. I will pray yeah. for you. I want you to prosper. And I, I hope that you grow better in that church than you have in mine. Yeah. And with the, with the family that I was telling you about, uh, kudos to them. They stuck around for mm. a long time. They mm. tried really, really hard. And I think we all grew from it. But finally for them, it was like death by a thousand cuts. They were just like, hey, <laughs> we gave it four years. And sometimes that's the right answer, uh -huh. yeah. right? We're, yeah. we're, we're only so much. And sometimes you just need to be honest about, gosh, if I was a more mature Christian, maybe I could you know, put it out and do 2000 cuts. But my wife is struggling, my kids are struggling, I'm struggling, I'm resenting, I'm, I, I, I'm tempting myself every day I walk into church and maybe I just need to do something else. Yeah. And sometimes that's the right answer. The concern I have is that people are so quick to do that because they're not valuing what they leave behind. Mm. And I, I recognize sometimes the right answer is to leave your church. Yeah, y You've lost trust with the elders. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not growing anymore. Uh, you've lost trust in the congregation. Yeah. Let's just make sure that as you do that trade-off, you're valuing both things biblically. And my concern is that we value ease and comfort of similarity, and we don't value the glory of a church full of differences. Yeah. One of the things that I try to, uh, a thought experiment I encourage people to do when they're thinking about leaving is just, yeah, listen, praise God, you're in, a, in the West in, in general, in America in particular, in the Bible Belt in super specific. Mm -hmm. And you, there are a lot of churches, you're free. I mean, in God's providence, you're in a place where you can find a different church where you'll be happier uh, as you worship there. But imagine you were in Corinth or Galatia, right? Like how, like, or in Jerusalem when, when the, the controversy with the widows happens, right? Like, what would you do there? You're a Christian and there's not another church within a 10 days walk from you. Mm. You're going to have to find some way, somehow by God's grace, with the help of his Holy Spirit to learn to love these people. Yeah. You know, so just, I, it's just something I, I don't intend for that to bind their conscience to make them stay. I just want them to see that like their capacity to deal with difficulties in the body of Christ could be higher, mm. you know, and it has been higher. For there was many a, Christians. There was a story I ran across. It was too late to include in the book, but I have a Isn't friend. Isn't that a bummer? I know. <laughs> next, next time, right? Yeah. I have a friend who's a pastor in Russia who himself has had a wild level of disagreement in his church over the war, you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but he was telling me about a friend of his who pastors a church in Crimea. And there were two guys who became Christians at the same time. One was a Russian soldier. Yeah. One was a Ukrainian soldier. Wow. Uh, and uh, the Ukrainian soldier had been one of the last holdouts when Russia took the Crimean airport, oh. uh, I guess now, what, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, so nearly his entire unit had been killed. He was left behind. They became Christians at the same time. 
There's mm. no other church around. Yeah. They got baptized together on the same day. They formed this wonderful, beautiful friendship because they both found Christ together. Mm. I thought, my goodness, if, a, if a, a Russian and Ukrainian soldier can find the oneness that they have in Christ, mm -hmm. surely we can do the same thing. Wow, I, I, that is a bummer that <laughs> you came across it after the. But hey, it's on your episode. Look there at that. it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if, if we go to second edition, it's going right uh, in there. No, now what you need is an is an Israel Palestine illustration. Well, it happens all the time, doesn't yeah, it? It does. I mean, Corey Ten Boom, her story of forgiveness with the uh, concentration camp guard. I mean, church history is replete with this. Yes. Yeah. All right, chapter two. Yeah. How can I love those people? Like how 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 can I actually love the people who drive me crazy in my church. Yeah. And uh, I start just where Paul does. With mercy, right? Yes. Yeah. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifice. Jesus does the same thing in Luke 6, uh, where he calls us to show mercy uh, because our Heavenly Father is merciful, mm. as we love our enemies. That... The fact that it's beyond my own strength to love that person is kind of the whole point. Right, right. Right? If I, the one kind of phrase I use for the book is easy love rarely shows off gospel power. Mm. Um, or to quote Jesus, if you, live, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Yeah. Right? What, what does that say about the power of Almighty God to change our hearts such that we can love those who we would otherwise be enemies with? Yeah. Now, uh, how do you, what, what, th this is good. You're giving us tools. How do we love people that we find it to be difficult to love? But how do we employ this, right? Like, okay, God's been merciful to me, so I can be merciful to this person. How, how do we think like that without becoming proud? Mm. Right? Because I mean, because yes, it's true. I've received mercy from God, but at least like in relation to other human beings, it's training me to think like I'm always the dispenser of mercy and these people are always the ones who need to receive mercy. Yeah, well, I think it's that, uh, like Jesus said, um, you know, he who's been forgiven little loves little. Yeah. Right, Luke seven forty seven, the jumbo jet of the New Testament. Like that's, that is gospel ethic right there. Yeah. That um, if you understand the mercy God has shown to you in your forgiveness, then you will love God. And if you love God, you will find yourself loving the people who are also made in his image, who also are redeemed by him. So, so, so I understand how humility or a pride can come because I'm, I'm the one kind of showing mercy to my benighted inferiors. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's not the love that comes from a love for God. Right. Right. If I begin with the vertical relationship of recognizing I am the chief of sinners, as Paul said, and I've been shown mercy, I've been forgiven, that, that can't help but overwhelm me in love for God. Then I'm looking around, where, where can I channel that love? So that's a very good, deep uh, theological answer. I was actually thinking something much simpler that you actually okay. give in the book. Well, tell me what I should be saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying. Let me lead you down the path. Thank you. The, uh, you, you. You are also the hard person to love. Oh, you yes. say that like in several different that's ways true. in the book. Yeah, like you're the idiot sometimes. Like you know, the, the right. The people who drive me crazy, I'm probably driving them crazy. Oh, absolutely. Totally. I can't believe they're not wearing a mask. Don't right. they know? And they're over there looking at you like, I can't believe he's wearing a mask. Doesn't he know? Yeah. 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 So, so uh, just a good awareness of the fact that you're uh, often confident, but seldom right yourself, right? To quote, <laughs> That's you right. Know? Yeah. Always confident, sometimes right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Number three, third question. Uh. What if I don't want, I should, I should actually state, so uh, chapter two, how can I love those people? Impossible love flows from impossible verses. That's the truth. That's the perspective okay. I need. Yeah. That I need to understand God's mercy if I'm going to have any hope of loving the people who drive me crazy. Yeah, yeah got that. Yeah, third question, what if I don't want to love them? And the truth there is that disunity at church lies about Jesus. Okay. And I just, very honestly, there's sometimes I look at people in my church, I'm like, okay, I know I'm supposed to love everybody. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to love these other people over here. I'll yeah. kind of ignore that person. And um, 
sometimes that's just, you know, you're in a large enough church. That's kind of how it happens. Yeah. Uh, but to the extent that that becomes a source of disunity in the body, that's where I think I need to have a more theological angle on things. So I'm, I'm struck in, in 1 Corinthians when the Corinthians are divided, right? When Paul rebukes them, his rebuke is very theological. He says, is Christ divided? Mm -hmm. And he's basically saying, hey, people, wait, wake up for a little bit. Like you realize these petty disagreements are about more than just you. They are lying about the unity of the God we serve. You see the same thing in a, a number of places in Romans 12 and then especially in Romans 14, where Paul basically says, look, if, if you divide over this issue, then you're looking bad, but also Christ is looking bad. Yeah. And that should change how you think about it. Uh, kind of like when you're in, in marriage uh, and you know, you're giving your wife the silent treatment and you know that eventually you know, you work things out so you can kind of have the satisfaction of making her feel bad right now because you're in the middle of a fight. Yeah. You put a theological angle that and you're okay, what is my behavior right now saying about Jesus Christ? I am lying about him. Mm. I'm saying that Jesus distances himself from his bride. Mm. I'm saying that Jesus acts selfishly with his bride. None of that is true. Right. And so even though I can kind of get away with it relationally, because of the theological dimension of what marriage signifies, I realize I don't want to get away with it. Mm -hmm. I want to do what honors Christ. Right. Same thing in our church, when I realize there's a theological label on every single relationship I have in my church and, and my attitude toward other people in my church is saying something true or false about Jesus, that changes how and why I want to love them. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add, brother. Let's move on, question number four. Okay, number four. Uh, wouldn't we be better off without them? Mm. Right? Like, okay, I read 1 Corinthians 12. I know that we're all different parts of the body and they're an elbow and I'm a knee and I need the elbow. But couldn't they be indispensable to someone else's church body instead of mine? Yeah. It would be so much easier. And I think the answer is it would. And yet in God's providence, he's put you together in the same body. Yeah. This is where that invitation in uh, Romans 12 comes uh, to be so real. Uh, so that we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I talked about that earlier. Um, we're not merely members of Christ's body together. We belong to each other. Uh, the example I use in the, in the book, it's, it's, it's not like the family that's always gotten along from the very beginning. It's like the blended family where, yeah. you know, on day one, you're looking at this step-sibling of yours and you're like, you know, do I really have to love you? Yeah. Um, and yet if things go well, 10 years later, we, we love each other because we belong, mm -hmm. right? We haven't always belonged, but we do now. And we've discovered that there's, there's a belonging we have. That's the family of God as well. We're a blended family, yeah. right? We, we didn't come together naturally. We've been all adopted into the we've same We've all household. been adopted Our together. Our dad was like, I'm going to adopt all these <laughs> orphans. <laughs> all, you know, several hundred million of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yet with a promise that we really do belong together. Right. And so if we focus on the fact that it's God's decision that brought us together, yeah. and we do share in common one father uh, and our brother Jesus Christ, that we will discover a time that we actually do belong together. Uh, obviously, we, you, know, you work with 1 Corinthians 12, but just it bears repeating. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. So do we really need them in our church? It literally says you cannot say, you right. cannot say that, right? Yeah. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, I love that he doesn't just stop there, right? He's like, actually, it's, it's the exact opposite. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker, mm. and I love that language, that seem to be weaker. Because isn't that how we look at people that we think are wrong about things in the church? We go, yeah. uh, you're weaker. And Paul goes, well, maybe. Maybe they are, but maybe they're not. Maybe they just seem that way to you. But in fact, they are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor than he goes on to. But yeah, we, we, we should never look at anybody or any contingency of people in the church and say, 
we don't need you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing that's interesting is when you lay a Romans 12 on top of 1 Corinthians 12. Okay. Because the answer in 1 Corinthians 12 is we need all the different parts of the body. Right. Which is true. Mm -hmm. And one thing I point out in the book is that I found that especially useful, not in terms of I need your skills or you need your perspective, but I need your faith. There's, yeah. there's ways in which if you and I disagree uh, over something that matters to me, um, and yet we're united in Christ, that your faith is a special encouragement to me. And, and by and, faith, you mean your ability to look past our differences from your perspective. Well, what do when you I, mean when by I talk faith? about your faith, I mean that I see you acting in faith even though you disagree with me over this particular issue. Right. So the example I give in the book is um, a couple in Kenya, uh, their son marries someone from a different tribe, mm -hmm. and yet she's a Christian. And the parents are overjoyed, even though this is a tribe that their tribe has had a lot of problems with over the mm -hmm. years. And so as the people from her tribe look at that, they say, okay, you are exercising faith in ways that I don't need to precisely because where you are in this disagreement. And that's a special encouragement to me. Their faith also is a protection for me. Because when you agree on everything in a church, I think you can get kind of sloppy. Okay. Uh, so if you disagree with my politics, uh, then you're probably going to kind of point out things where my faith and my politics are somewhat at odds. Whereas if we agree on everything, you'll never notice that. Mm. So 1 Corinthians 12, we need each other. And yet, I think if we only have 1 Corinthians 12, we can be tempted to be somewhat utilitarian about right. these differences in the church. Right, yeah. Like, well, that person is necessary because I need them. That's, they do this. They fill the slot. They yeah. meet this need for me. Yeah. That's a very consumeristic way to view things. Yeah. And, uh, or it can be. It yeah. can be. And, 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 and that is not the way you build a real friendship. Okay. Which is why I think Paul layering Romans 12 on top of 1 Corinthians 12 is so useful. Because he said it's, it's not merely that you need each other. It's that you belong to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, you need each other because you belong to yes, one another. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's, that idea of we belong together, I think, is a beautiful foundation for friendship. Yeah. Uh, in a way that gets us away from some of the kind of way that you mentioned earlier that we can almost look down on each other in the way that we treat each other in the church. Yeah. You talk, uh, you talk about commitment and comfort and starting with a particular framework, uh, saying that we have to begin with the commitment framework. Was it, was it, was that what it was? Or you, you were talking about like you married your wife and mm. like, you know, I actually didn't know her, but once we were committed, then I, then I got to know her. Can you, can you riff on that? Yeah. That's actually from the epilogue in the book. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, that's okay. okay. Where I just talk about the fact that meaningful church membership makes all this work better. Uh, uh, that, um, the new Testament calls me to be committed to these people, not because I become their best friend, not because I'm really comfortable with them. I'm committed to them because Christ has committed himself to me and that's what his followers do. Yeah. And what, what embodies that ethic is church membership mm -hmm. where I say, I am committing to love these people. I don't even know all their names yet, let alone am I comfortable with them, but I'm going yeah. to love them because Christ has loved me. Yeah. The example, kind of the, the analogy is marriage that you know, the day I married my wife 22 years ago, I thought I knew her pretty well, but in retrospect, I hardly knew her at all. I think everybody's experienced. Like you kind of know the person and then you look back after your first anniversary, you're like, wow, I've uh -huh. learned a lot since uh -huh. then. And yet the day we got married, I made some massive commitments to love and to cherish and to death do us part to someone I didn't know that well. And inside the safe walls of that commitment, there's been a relationship which has flowered like un unlike anything I've ever experienced before. Yeah. And there's all kinds of dissimilarities between church and marriage. Like we don't do to death do us part when right. we join a church. And yet it still is, I think, somewhat unique among human relationships where the commitment comes first, the comfort follows. Mm. And so what Paul calls us to do here is to say, look, I know they're different from you. And yet you are one in Christ. So commit yourself to love them and you'll find the comfort comes as it follows. And it's, it's really incredible if you can make it through, uh, maybe it's a big, big, the big lump at the beginning or a series of lumps at the beginning. But if you can make it over that first initial lump, 
It really is so fruitful. And it's so, I mean, one of my, one of my best friends, most uh, staunch encouragers in ministry is a guy that we just had a really hard time at first mm. because we were so different. Yeah. But when we understood that we were committed to one another no matter what, and we got through that, our relationship has it's just grown so sweet. In contrast, there are often situations where you you meet a guy and you're like, we're going to be best friends forever. Like, do you want to go do karate in the garage? You know, like we, we're just movie simpatico. And then as time goes on and stresses are added to the relationship, you see... I love how you do this. This is a best friend for Sean DeMars. Yeah. Karate in the garage. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no but, mats. No, <laughs> that's right. All, all on concrete. But... Uh, that all those kinds of relationships can often end up being the ones that are, are the most strained because what you were most excited about wasn't that deep. It was well, very it, superficial. It's, it's not. It's not load bearing. It can, yeah, it can't like, sustain you. Karate is not as load bearing for a friendship as Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've thought, "Oh, this guy is going to be my my ride or die," mm -hmm. and then it ends up we end up separated somehow. And the guy that you thought this guy is going to drive me, he's going to be a headache. He ends up being the best companion for ministry. Yeah, I, I think very often the people with in your church with whom you share least in common have the potential to become your deepest friendships. Ooh, now did you say that in the book? I did. There you yes. go. Yeah, I've been saying it a lot longer in the book. Okay, and it's because the only thing you can build that friendship on is Jesus Christ, and a shared affection for Jesus is far more load bearing for friendship than any other common, you know, interest you guys might have. Are you saying that too strongly? I don't think so because I said have the potential to be, yeah, yeah. not guaranteed to right. be. Yeah, yeah. I've I've gotten a little wiser how I've said that over the years. Yeah. But I think I've seen that in my own life. Yeah. Other people probably have as well. Yeah. And yet that's not where we start. Right. Right. We start and I'm like, whoa, that's a weirdo over there. Mm -hmm. I don't understand them. I'm gonna stay away. Yeah. And I think Paul would say, No, they're your brother, they're your sister. See what you can discover here. Yeah. It's gonna take more patience. It's going to take more charity. It's going to take more time. You're going to bump your nose a little bit on the way. Uh -huh. And yet that's a skill you can improve in over time, building on Christ rather than comfort. Yeah. And it's a wonderful skill to have. And it's, it's deep. It's rich. That's why inviting people to do this isn't just about doing what's correct. Mm. It's about what's doing what's joyful. Okay. That there is joy here. You see that there as you get into uh, even the very end of this section where Paul closes with this prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace mm. in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Just wonderful words are hope, joy, peace, power. That's what he's offering to us. Not just like the Marine Corps of church, like, well, these are the hard people love, so you should love them anyway. Yeah. Um, right. What's at stake is our joy. All right. So that was question five or question four? That was question four. All right. Question five. How can I be friends with those people? Hmm. So this is assuming, okay, we've got the, the theological building blocks in place. Okay. I see the need. How do I build I, a I just real don't know what to do. Yeah. Yes. You just go up and be like, all right, tell me about Alabama football, I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and and there, I need a dose of realism. You okay. can't be best friends with everybody in your church. Amen. And yet, let's balance that with what Paul says here in Romans 12, love one another with brotherly affection. That's like mic drop. Really? So... I Jew, be Gentile, able, slave, free. Yes. Right? Yes. We, Affection. Not just, I'm going to white knuckle my way through this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be nice to you and not say mean things to you, even though I'm thinking them in my mind. I'm going to have affection for you. Jesus did not come to make us nice merely. He came to make us new. Yes. Right? That's a great way yeah. to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want to back off a little bit from the ESV translation because you don't have to translate it that way. Um, but he's saying love one another with the kind of, uh, familiar feelings you would have with your family. Yeah, whatever little quibble someone might have with that, the the, the impulse is all throughout uh, the New Testament, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I, I find where he goes next to be really helpful. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And it's like, okay, rejoice in hope. Where have I heard that before? And you go back to Romans 5 and you are thinking, okay, that's right. In Romans chapter 5, 
He said, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our suffering. So like, okay, joy, hope, suffering, exactly the same stuff he's talking about here in Romans 12. I think what he's saying is you take that theological concept of Romans 5, where we are rejoicing in the hope of what God is doing in our salvation, the glory he's getting of our salvation. He's saying, okay, take that concept, insert it into your friendships here with those Gentile Christians over there, if he's talking yeah. to Jews. Yeah. So you can have hope that leads to joy through what God is doing in their lives. Oh. I think so often our culture tells us to define ourselves by what's in the past. Okay. Right. Define yourself based on your culture of birth or define yourself based on your past hurts or your victimhood or whatever it might be. You're defined based on the past. We don't do that as Christians, right? We define ourselves based on our future. We define ourselves based on hope of what God is doing. And so if I am struggling to love you, Sean, I can find joy in the hope of what God is doing in you that I will see someday in the future. Yeah. Um, Wait, I see this. Let, sorry, let's just yeah. not breeze past that. It's such a, you've, you've been kind of like, da, 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 da. I don't want people to like kind of miss what you just said. Okay. There's something about this person who's driving you crazy. Yes. Which at the moment is blinding you to the glory of what they will one day be. Yes. Right? Like, one day they're going to be so much wiser, so much more godly, so much more mature. And, and then one day they're going to be perfectly glorified, mm -hmm. right? But even in this life, give it 15 years. And they are being sanctified. They're being sanctified. Yes. The same spirit in you is in them. Yeah. And so look, don't just look at who they are now. Look through them in time to who they will be and try to like cling to that. Yes. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Sometimes you can't see any of that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Be patient. Be constant in prayer. Uh, I think I see a, a, a sense of that with my own kids, right? So, you know, I'll see one of my kids do something really kind and selfless for another one of my children. I just, that's like the greatest experience for a parent. Yeah. I, that makes me so happy and excited. But it's not like I'm naive of like, oh, finally, we've beat the selfishest thing. Yeah. And they're, you know, forever going to be selfless. And yet I'm, I'm taking joy in the hope that I'm beginning to see this flower unfold. Yeah. And if, if I can have that joy that comes through hope with my kids, I think I can do it also with fellow church members. Mm where I can see a little glimpse of what God is doing in that person. Yeah. And I can rejoice in that. And that gives me a real affection for them in the friendship. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure Paul intended this to be kind of a recipe for what he talks about, but I do find interesting that the concepts are put so closely together in Romans 12. Well, that, I mean, when you read the book of Ephesians, which is all about unity in the church, uh, and he kind of, it culminates in chapter four. He's like, all right, you, you audience sent the key. You guys knew it was coming. This has really all <laughs> been leading up to you. Uh, he daisy chains his thoughts kind of leading up to them throughout the letter. So I don't think it's unfair for you to point back to that and see the, those things being connected in Paul's mind. Mm -hmm. But speaking of Philippians 4, yeah. on this need for like genuine affection, not like white knuckles, I guess we're in the same family, so we have to find some way to get along. Uh, in Philippians 4, 1, Paul says this. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long mm. for, mm. my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. And then he says, again, my beloved, right? Mm. So when Paul is talking about this church, and not even this church, the Corinthians, which are driving him crazy, or the Cal Galatians who are, about to, yes. yeah, who are about to abandon the gospel, right? Yeah. It's it's not like I'm tolerating you because Jesus says I have to, and I guess I'm going to obey Jesus. It's like, no, I genuinely love that, that language of longing. It's mm -hmm. like the our hearts are bound together, though we're separated, right? So there should be something that says our hearts are together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so think about those relationships at church that are difficult and then just start reading Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine. You're not mm -hmm. white-knuckling it through. That's not genuine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? That's, that could be tokenism. 
That's like, well, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna make you my friend because it makes me look better. Mm -hmm. That's not genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Wow, is that a standard mm -hmm. for us? Outdo one another in showing honor. That I, I so am admiring you as a fellow believer in Christ. I want to honor you. Yeah. So different from the noblesse oblige, like I'm kind of, you know, lifting up my benighted inferiors. Do not be slothful and zeal. So all of that do zealously, fervent in spirit as I serve the Lord, which is a reminder, this is largely what serving the Lord means. If I'm not willing to do this, Romans 12, 9 to 11, I'm not serving the Lord. And I do think that uh, verse 12 kind of powers the whole thing. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And then he talks about what that sacrifice is going to look like as, yeah. as we have that affection for one another. <clears throat> That's so good, brother. Can we can we double tap something there? Uh, the, the, the brotherly love. I, I'm a single child, but I've seen it in others. Th there's something about your brother or your sister. Uh, you know, I saw it for the first time really with my wife. She was around her younger sister at the time. We were both 19. She was still pretty. My wife was still pretty immature. And her and her sister got into a spat, you know, her like 16 year old sister. And later on that night, I, I, I talked to her about it and I was like, what was that? You know? And she, she was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I thought you loved your sister. And she was like, I do. And I was like, well, what was that? And she was like, oh, you don't understand. This is, this is what family does, right? Now, what, what, what they did is not good or Christian or mature, but there, there's something there about like, no matter how much your sibling drives you crazy, you're my brother. Yeah. I love you. We're in this together. I'm going to be here for you. And the rules of engagement look different from family to family. Right, yeah. Which can get us into trouble at church because I'm sort of treating you like my uh, brother. Oh, yeah. And you're like, whoa, that was like nuclear Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even with your like sense of humor, you know? Yes. Yeah. And that's where we realize, oh, the family of God is a little more complicated. Yeah. 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 It's more like 3D chess. Um, uh, while I'm here in Philippians 4, let me ask you, uh, let's not forget where we were walking through the chapters, yep. but um, Paul says, uh, I, I entreat you, Audion, and I entreat Synthache to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So first of all, I love that he points to their track record of like gospel labor. Mm. He's like, hey, both of you guys love Jesus. Together. Yeah, we've been yes. partnered together, right? So you yeah. got to love each other. But then he, he enlists the help of the true companion. Mm. Ooh, who is that? Doesn't matter. Um, do you ever find it? Well, I guess the answer to this has to be yes. Uh, appropriate to enlist like the help of someone to help brothers and sisters in the church love each other? You know, one of the examples I, I use in the chapter, again, a real example is um, a person in the church was just really struggling with loving someone who disagree, who they disagree with on some very significant matters, yeah. uh, kind of social blogosphere type stuff. And so she called another guy in the church who she knew agreed with her on some of those matters and yet was good friends with this other guy. Okay. And basically said, this man is driving me up the wall. And I, I, I know I shouldn't be feeling the way I do, but I can't stand him. Yeah. Can you help me? Mm. And I so admire that sister for having the humility to disclose the ugliness of heart to somebody yeah. and for taking such a a concrete step toward trying to kind of get underneath this. Yeah. So yes, you know, very often the solution is not going to be, certainly not navel gazing, maybe not even merely sticking your head in Romans 12. It's going to be getting someone who you knows you and maybe who knows this other person and yeah. saying, look, can you help me figure out the way I'm messing this up? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, whenever I have been in an experience where there's been a, even where I've needed it, a, a true companion, a third party mediator, the, the best of them, they don't just help you learn how to get along in the church. They actually say, say things, they point out things that help you grow affection mm -hmm. for that person, right? Yeah. That, that help you understand that person in such a way that goes, you know, ultimately I still disagree with your position or whatever the case may be, 
But now that I see it from your perspective, I actually really respect you. Mm. You know, it's so important. It's so important to have that when you're trying to move forward. Yeah. Because uh, we in the church, we don't really need ceasefire agreements. I mean, sometimes that's like the bare minimum and that's the best we can hope for, but that's never what we're aiming for, right? Well, and sadly, I think sometimes we put up with it. We're mm. like, well, this is the best way. You have this kind of icy, fragile, um, delicate piece. Yeah. That is, it's like what Tim Keller talks about in his marriage book, A Truce Marriage. Oh. Like we've just kind of gotten this thing and it works and we'll hold the peace and we'll sort of deal with it. It doesn't honor God. Right. Right. We want the kind of rich, vibrant, deep peace yeah. that honors God, but it will involve kind of breaking through that ice and saying, okay, we're going to deal with the hard issues. Yeah. All right. Question number six. Okay. How can I really forgive those people? It's interesting. This chapter was not in the book originally, but I was walking through the table of contents with a sister in my church. We were just talking about the book and we finished. She said, what about forgiveness? I said, ah, it's important, but it's not in Romans 12, 13, and 14, and 15. So I didn't put it in there. Yeah. And uh, I kept thinking about it. I thought, gosh, it would be really good to have a chapter on forgiveness in here. And I, I just kept looking at the end of Romans 12, where Paul says that, that statement, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, which is how... Uh, we should not avenge ourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Like, gosh, that sounds an awful <coughs> lot. I said, gosh, that sounds an <coughs> awful lot like Jesus in Luke 6 as he tells us to love our enemies. Mm. It is like Paul says, to the, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Um, and of course, Jesus commands to love our enemies as a foundation then for, as he goes on the next verse, forgiving them. I thought, you know what? I, Paul, I don't think is talking about forgiveness, but I think he is giving us here the root of forgiveness. Okay, which is? That uh, forgiveness is an act of injustice. Not the way we normally think about injustice, but when I forgive you, I decide to not give you what you deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah and instead take it on myself. And I begin to think about all the ways in which forgiveness seems to fail us, where we honestly think we've forgiven, but the relationship just is, it doesn't heal, it doesn't reconcile. I thought, you know, very often, the, sometimes forgiveness can't achieve reconciliation. It's a fallen world, we need to be realistic about that. Okay. But sometimes the reason why forgiveness doesn't result in a reconciled relationship isn't because it's impossible, because I didn't take on myself the full injustice of forgiveness, mm. right? I ch chose not to give you the silent treatment, which I think you deserved. So in that sense, it felt unfair to me. And so I kind of convinced myself that you were forgiven. But I didn't then take it on myself to pursue you in friendship, mm. to pursue you in affection, yeah. which is what forgiveness would have evolved. Yeah. Um, but you're not saying that every person who forgives has to make friends with the person that they've. No, I think it's possible, but I think we, I think we, we, we give up too easily, especially in the church. Especially in the church, right? Keep in mind, the, the church is one of the few places in life where relationships are close enough that you can really hurt each other. Yeah. But the community is large enough you can just kind of get along and avoid them, and you won't notice anything's wrong, mm. unless you're in a church of like 15 people. You know, you get a church of 70 or more. And you can have that dynamic. And I think you can kind of just wall that friendship off, keep going, and you'll be, it looks like things are fine. Yeah. Um, and so Paul's statement here, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The idea that God will secure justice, I think is absolutely necessary if we're to embrace full forgiveness. Yeah. Where I don't merely stop doing bad things to you where I don't merely refrain from punishing you, but I actually say, I'm going to take on myself the cost of your sin against me, which is of course exactly how Jesus describes forgiveness in Matthew 18, yeah. right? You've got the, the guy who owes the money lender a whole mm -hmm. bunch of money and the money lender takes the debt on himself. Right. That's Jesus. It's an economic 
uh, image of forgiveness. Right. And so when you sin against me and I forgive you, it's not merely I'm saying, I'm not gonna punish you. It's saying, I'm gonna take that cost on myself. I'm gonna take it cheerfully. I'm gonna do so readily because I love you. And the only way I can accept that amount of injustice is if I really put all my chips on the justice of God mm -hmm. and say, God is the one who exercises justice. Therefore, I can do what is the opposite of justice. And that doesn't mean we're not trying to pursue confession and repentance. It just means I'm not trying to extract everything from you that I feel like is owed in light of the sin. And beyond that, I turn the other cheek. Yeah, and I, yeah. Right, I give you the opposite of what your sin deserves. So when you see a brother in the church who has been sinned against by another brother, not only does he forgive him, but he also actively continues to pursue him in friendship. I think very often that is forgiveness. Yeah, that's right. Right, if, if your sin against me deserves me to ignore you and give it the silent treatment, yeah. I think, okay, what's the opposite of what your sin deserves? The opposite is for me to pursue you in friendship and give you opportunities to rebuild that affection. Yeah. You know, going back to what you were saying earlier about what it's possible to like wall off that relationship. A, a lot of your book kind of, it, it keeps coming back to this theme of not, not just what could we do, but what should we be aiming to do that's maximally uh, glorifying for the Lord? It, you know, you have four ligaments in your knee you know, the front, the back, and then the two on the side. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to tear a ligament mm. like an ACL and to be able to cope, to be able to adapt and continue to do whatever their respective sport is without that ligament. But you know what happens over time? The other ligaments get stressed because of it. Mm. The knee becomes arthritic and creaky. And be, and the re why do they do that? Because, you know, you get an ACL surgery, you're out for nine months. But if you get it done well, you're going to have knees that are healthy well into your, how you know, whatever, 70, 80, 90, you know. Yeah. You, you, but if you say, I can't, I don't want to deal with this initial discomfort of, mm. of the surgery, you, you may cope, you may get by, but you're going to end up spending the last decades of your life in extreme discomfort. All that to say, it may be immediately more uncomfortable to try to work through this together, but the payoff is going to be huge. Whereas if you kind of wall it off and say, it was easier for me now not to deal with it. Well, that may be true, but your heart's going to get arthritic and the church is going to get arthritic. And, and there are going to be some long-term consequences here that in the end are going to be worse and you're going to wish you would have dealt with it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think very often we underestimate how radical forgiveness really is. Mm. And Paul gives us the theological foundation for radical forgiveness that subverts justice, that gives you the opposite of what justice demands. And so the truth here is divine justice empowers full forgiveness. Mm. And, you know, people have read lots of stuff on forgiveness. Maybe you read Tim Keller's recent book on forgiveness. I thought it was wonderful. It was very good. Yeah, so I good. To the audio book. Um, this is just a meditation on one aspect of forgiveness yeah. to really think through the relationship between justice and forgiveness and how that can allow me to recognize where my attempts at forgiveness are not as radical as what Jesus really calls me to. Yeah, that's good, brother. All right, question yeah. seven. Okay, how can I stop judging and despising those people? Now this is where, how can I stop judging and despising? Now we're really getting into the meat of Romans 14, right? You got it, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and what we see is we go from Romans 12, 1 into uh, Romans Skip 14. Skip Romans 13. Well, you know. For the sake of this book. Well, yeah, what's going on there is end of Romans 12, he says that we should uh, feed your enemy, give your enemy something to drink. And I think the, the obvious question then is, well, does that mean there's no room for earthly justice? Are we really to leave everything to God? Right. And so we get this little sidebar on human government to right. say it is instituted by God. It's the state's job to pursue justice on earth. Yes. And then at the end of Romans 13, he has this beautiful transition. Uh, you know, what if I told you I want you to transition from uh, political philosophy to love in two paragraphs? Well, that's what Paul does right here. Wow. Um, so we get back to love there in verse in chapter 14. But now we're talking about, I think, a new level of difficulty, which is I'm not just loving people who have differences in backgrounds or differences in preference. I'm now loving people who have differences in conviction. Yeah. And I think for the church today, that is so important. Why? <laughs> Why? You're a pastor. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that there's much difference in our convictions. I mean, 
Goodness gracious. Like I just think about what's going on in the news right now, right? There are going to be some people who feel like the most important thing the church can do today is to support Israel. Mm -hmm. And some people feel like the most important thing the church can do today is to plead with Israel not to invade Gaza, yeah. right? And you can have Christians in the same church who are disagreeing on that issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got an election going on right now. Maybe the results are already out to elect a new Speaker of the House. And some people, at least in my church, are yeah. very passionate about this person. Some people are like, no, 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 let's have this person instead. Yeah. You can disagree about that. Um, I think as our society becomes more secular, it seems that we are disagreeing on things at church in ways that are more convictional. What do you mean? So like, what was the big disagreement in church in the 1990s? It was the worship wars. Yeah. I think many pastors long for those days when that's the only thing we disagree music on. Contemporary yeah, music right. versus hymns, right? Because today you've got people disagreeing on like, can, can you recommend a book by that author? Right. Uh, can you really put your pronouns in your email signature? Are you, you know, are you just giving in to the, the transgender agenda? Uh, you know, I saw you pass a card to your gay office mate after his uh, so-called wedding. You know, are you endorsing? Just mm -hmm. in a secular culture, I think there are more ways that Christians can disagree about what it means to be faithful and follow Christ. Wouldn't you say that... Uh a leading question, obviously. Uh, objection, leading the witness. Yes. W wouldn't you say, though, that as the United States is growing increasingly s secular, we're actually more in tune with the environment that the New Testament was written in? Uh, in some ways. In some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the New Testament is written to Christians who are a minority in the culture. Yeah. They don't have cultural power. Yeah. And I think uh, we can take a hint from Paul here in Romans 14. When you don't have cultural power you are potentially going to have more convictional disagreements. Get okay. used to it. Yeah. And Paul's basic message in Romans 14 is uh, what's really right and what's really wrong is often not the particular convictional disagreement, but whether you can love mm. across that disagreement. So the most important thing isn't who's right here, but how you handle your view of who's right. Yes, and of course that's not true for everything. No. And right. there's a good amount of discernment that you've got to think through biblically to determine where that's true, but it's often true. Let, let's just take one example he uses, holy days, right? Yep. So we might, uh, let's talk about Christmas, right? Christmas trees, are they pagan or not, right? Should we give gifts? Should we should we do a Christmas service? Any number of, the Christians can be very opinionated about holy days, right? Like Easter bunny stuff, right? The The question isn't, is a Christmas tree pagan or not? There there, there may be a right it's or a wrong It's a fine answer. question to discuss. Yeah. Yes. But how we handle our convictions, how we handle our disagreement over that is more important. Yeah, so Romans 14, 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So the conviction disagreement here is whether or not Christians could eat meat. Mm -hmm. I think what's going on here meat is you've got idols. Jewish Christians who are still holding to Old Testament dietary laws, and the easiest way to keep kosher is to just not eat meat at all. I don't think this is food sacrifice to idols. Not it like seems in to first be the case Corinthians. elsewhere. Okay, gotcha. Um, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I could explain why, but we don't need to get into that. And so Paul's saying, look, Gentiles, you're right. When Jesus said that all things were clean, he meant it. So you're, you're right in this particular disagreement. And yet what's really wrong is not their position on the disagreement. It's if you make them stumble by what you eat. Mm -hmm. So if you decide that your Christian freedom is worth more than their conscience, that's what's really wrong. Uh, so I think what Paul does here is he, he has this beautiful reprioritization of his right and wrong mm -hmm. that gives us a different perspective. It's a fine thing to debate whether you should have Christmas trees or not. Sure. But what really matters, as you said, is are you going to love them and protect their conscience yeah. through that disagreement that you have. And that doesn't even mean uh, it, uh, you would agree that we don't try to inform and calibrate people's consciences, right? It's just it's just the way that you go about it. Yeah. And with the particular weight uh, being borne by those who are strong. Yes. Right. And by strong, Paul means uh, the one 
who has the more permissive conscience. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, because so, in this case, those people happen to be right. Well, you go to, so if you go to 1 Corinthians, Paul says, we know that there, there are no other gods, right? So you see this whole meat sacrifice to idols thing, and you're like, well, I know that there's actually no such thing as another god, and whatever spooky voodoo thing they did over the meat doesn't, doesn't matter to matter. me. It's a steak, right? Yeah, yeah. But if that's you and your conscience is more permissive, you have to handle that in such a way that takes into account your weaker brother. Yeah. So at church, you're often going to encounter people who have more permissive consciences than mm -hmm. yours. And uh, when that happens, you are going to judge them. Mm -hmm. Or their consciences are more restrictive than yours. Mm -hmm. uh, so and You're going to judge them in a different way. <laughs> you're going to despise them, I think is yeah. the word Paul uses. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't feel like they can have a Christmas tree. And I'm like, oh, that's yeah, so crazy. Idiots. And then I resent them because now I, you know, can't have a Christmas tree myself because their kids are at my house mm -hmm. all the time and I don't want to cause them to uh -huh, stumble and it uh -huh. makes me mad, right? And so what do you, how do you stop that? I think that's a real challenge. Like, I know I'm judging that person, but I can't just turn it off. I know it's wrong. What do I do about it? Yeah. And that's where I think Paul gives us a super helpful approach here. Uh, he says, verse five, one person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes as an honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. Paul's saying, look, you guys disagree over whether you can celebrate Sabbath days anymore or not. Mm -hmm. I just want to rec to you to recognize the person who observes the day is observing it in honor of the Lord. And let's just note that that person is exercising faith to do something, even if you disagree with what they're doing, and that yeah. faith is important to recognize. You, you see this all the time outside of like theological questions. It's important if someone is at least wrong in the right direction. Right. If you yes. trust their motives, right? Yes. If you trust that they're trying to do the right thing, even though they may have missed the mark, versus someone you're like, I don't trust them, I don't like them. I think this whole thing smells funny from beginning to end. Right. Yeah. So people often say you should give others the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. I think Paul is doing something very helpful and going a step further. He's saying, don't just give them the benefit of the doubt. Ask them how their faith motivates an opinion that is contrary to mine. Wow, yeah. And if I ask that question, uh, sometimes I will find out I was right. Yeah. And their motives are impure. Yeah. At least then I'm not naive about something which isn't true. But sometimes I'll discover, oh, okay, I hadn't thought about how your Christian faith could motivate you to vote in that direction. Or to put your kids in public school. Or to school. put your kids in that school. I just kind of assumed you put your kids in public school because you're worldly. Or you just weren't thinking about it at all. Yes. Right? The fact is you actually have thought about this a lot. You've arrived at a different conclusion. Yeah, than me, I may still disagree with uh -huh. you and want my kids to be homeschooled, but now at least I can see, okay, there's, there's something that is Christ honoring in what you're doing and I do think that can be the antidote to a lot of those judging feelings in my heart. Yeah. Uh, because what felt to me like an irreconcilable difference in right and wrong now becomes two different ways to exercise the same good thing, which is trust in Christ. That can obviously be taken to an extreme where we end up with kind of moral relativism and just because your heart's in the right place, sure. doesn't matter what you do. Obviously, we need to be wise in how we approach this, but I do well, think- Well, Paul does that in 1 Corinthians 12. He's like, listen, at the end of the day, you can't be in the temple with a prostitute, right? <laughs> right? Like you can't yes. do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if I if I don't merely assume the best, uh -huh. but I actually walk through that door to ask you why you're doing what you're doing, I think I'll often find that's the path to beginning to release some of those judging and despising motives in my heart. Yeah. That's really good, brother. We could probably keep talking more about that, but let's go on to, okay. I think, final number question. Eight. Question number eight. Yeah, yeah. How can I love those people when they're wrong? And this, again, is uh, Romans 14. It's like, okay, I'm right. They're wrong. Clearly, the right answer is for them to, you know, fess up and mm -hmm. repent. And again, Paul's just, he doesn't do that. Yeah. He says, you got to love them anyway. And uh, what I think is notable about Romans 14 is how often he talks about the judgment of God. I think six different times in this chapter, he references the judgment of God. And if I'm going to love people who have opinions and convictions that are contrary to mine, 
I have got to keep the judgment of God in mind. I need Specifically to keep, that God is going to judge them. God will judge them. I don't need to. It's not my yeah, job. Right. But also that God will judge me. Yeah. And that he will hold me particularly to account for how well I love them. Mm. And in fact, on judgment day, whether or not I love them well will probably matter more than whether I ended up on the right side in this debate. Oh. And, and I mean, you, you see that so much, brother. You know I'm the the anti-critical theory guy. Yep. But you were at a pastor's gathering where I gave a talk where I was basically saying this to all the guys who I think are on the right side of the argument with me. But I think on Judgment Day, they're going to be surprised how displeased the, the Lord is with them for the way that they're handling mm. it, you know? Mm. Um and, and we've probably been there ourselves, right? Been right in the wrong way. Is this, is this sophomoric? Be, I mean, I mean, isn't, it doesn't, I can imagine an objector coming along and saying, uh, you guys are just tone policing, right? Like here we are out here in these Christian streets fighting for our lives. Just, you know, the, the rising tide of secularism and Satan's at our doorstep and you guys are out here tone policing. What would you say to them? I just say read, read Romans 14 <laughs> it's in the Bible. prayerfully yeah. <laughs> and uh, ask the Lord to use these words to convict you if you're wrong. Yeah. And that's the best I can do, right? Yeah. I can just say, look, let's spend time in the word of God. Let's ask the spirit to convict us where we're wrong. But I think these words are terribly convicting. Yeah. Um, particularly when I begin to feel like, okay, this particular question is so important to get the right answer to. It doesn't matter how I get there. Well, that's dangerous. I don't think Paul sides well with me when I do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good, brother. And then we already covered the epilogue. Yeah, I, I the got... epilogue is just, you know, there, there's some aspects of church structure that can make it easier to uh -huh. do what Paul talks about, and some things make it harder. You wouldn't so, be a nine marks guy if you didn't somehow get us, exactly. get us back to polity. Well, like, you know, if I have my theology of conversion done well, if it's biblical, then I'm less likely to uh, fill a church full of people who think they're Christians because they prayed a prayer or yeah. you know, walked an aisle, but they're not actually dwelt by the Spirit of God, and they yeah. can't do these things that Paul talks about. If I uh, am careful about membership, uh, that means that my church is going to be filled with people who were commitment first, not comfort first. Yeah. And I think that sets them up very well to do this because the consumerism that membership pushes back against makes it almost impossible for me to do what Paul talks about here. Yeah. yeah. You take elders. The if you have, I'm just. I don't think you even do this, but I'm just. I'm riffing yeah. right along with you. If you take the qualifications, the character qualifications for an elder seriously. Mm. They're going to be the kind of men who are role modeling what you're talking about. They'll in this submit book. to one another. And yeah. 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 I mean, even, and I've seen this on elder boards before. I've, I've actually seen both. I've seen the negative and the positive. I've seen the negative where these brothers are ready to kill each other. Mm. And they're, they're co, they're co shepherds in the church and they're not doing anything that they need to do to work through it until it explodes. And then you're left trying to put the pieces back together. Mm. Versus I've also seen elders who are like, you know, brother, I have to tell you, you're driving me nuts. Mm. I love you. Let's sit down and figure this out, yeah. you know? Uh, and when you have elders who can do that, it just trickles down. Uh, yeah, but if you pick your elders church. because these are the prominent men in the community. Right, the good business guys. The, uh, the not based givers. on the character qualifications of First Timothy 3, yeah. then you end up with, you know, a bunch of bulls in the china shop kind of goring each other. Yeah, yes. that's right. Final question for you here related to the book. Uh, <clears throat> Do we need this? Is this generation, or at least in our location, is this is this uniquely needed? Uh, let me let me say it like this. You know, people have been saying America is more divided than ever, right? Well, what about the Civil War? You yeah, know, right? Uh, every generation feels like it. The problems that it's facing, the threats that it's facing, are are more you know unique than anything anybody has ever faced before but you highlight four aspects in the book uh you highlight four aspects of our cultural moment that are are making us feel these things more acutely you talk about social media the increase in ethnic and racial diversity society becoming more secular and a decreased tolerance and societal discourse for any deviation from the established orthodoxy. Do you think that that means that we are facing something more acutely than, than generations past? 
Yeah, I do. Okay. And obviously some of those trends I described are wonderful, right? Answers yeah. that we have prayed about for decades. Increased diversity, yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, which just means that you're more likely, especially if you're a white Christian in the United States, to be at church with people who aren't white. Yeah. Which means that you're probably going to uh, have differences in upbringing, culture, and even politics that tend to correlate by ethnicity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other things I think are undeniably bad. So we do have an increasingly polarized political environment. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the news here is that doesn't stop at the doors of the church. You're, you're going to find there are some political positions that are not represented or should not be represented in the church. Right. But you will find a great diversity of political opinions that are. Yeah. And uh, you have to recognize that that's part of what it means that we've built the church about Christ and not just and not Christ in politics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. You can tell me if we... And I should say, at least in my church, I do feel like it's different than it was 20 years ago. What's the it? Uh, the the kind of disagreements we have as a church. Okay. And I think I, I quote uh, uh, Michael Emerson in there um, talking about kind of his, his... He looks broadly across evangelical churches as a sociologist. He also feels and sees that there's a, there's a level of stridency in the discourse that hasn't been there in the past. So I don't know if this is, you know, the worst in 50 years or the worst in 10 years. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to get worse or get better, but I, I do think that for many Christians, there's a level of uh, stridency and difference that's difficult that they're not used to. Yeah. And I think we, we, we need to learn how to love in that kind of environment because I don't anticipate it's going away. And so you wrote a book about it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. That is enough about that book. Um, can you tell us the name one more time? Love the Ones Who Drive You Crazy. Love the Ones Who Drive You Crazy. Available for pre-order right pre -order now. Pre-order right now. Thanksgiving is when it comes out. And I think it's number four overall in books on Amazon right yeah, now. I think it's six million something <laughs> last time I looked. Yes. <laughs> so I was a little off. <laughs> uh, to, to our viewers, let me just tell you, I read it. I was so encouraged by it. I was so encouraged by it. I thought, I wonder if this is something that I want. Like, we have a smaller church. I want everyone to read through together in like a, a small group semester, mm. you know, just have, just take nine weeks and just work through this book. Uh, I think the payoff will, we're going to talk about this in an elders meeting. So that that's, that's how much I haven't thought about doing that with any other book other than compelling community. Mm. But I think this book is actually more accessible. Compelling community is what I think you should read with your elders. This is a book that I would like yeah, to read. Yeah. Compelling community members. was written for elders and pastors. Yeah. And I've heard it used by lots of people. And in fact, I put together a study guide yeah. for small groups because I heard so many small groups were using it. And mm. I was like, ah, we need a little translation if yeah. you're going to use it and you're in the pew and not in the pulpit. So you did the study guide. So the study guide does this on the translation. But this one very much is written for the pew. It's, it's I think, useful for pastors. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's aimed at every Christian. Yeah, so good. Um, Hey, did I tell you about my friend? She, uh, she, the the girl who only eats vegetables. That one I've not heard yet. Oh, so yes, you, you've never. But I, I I tremble. Yes. So you've never heard of her before. Uh, that's good. Actually, it's not good. <laughs> wow. So now I'm the difficult one. Hey, you're the, if you don't like a good dad joke, you're the difficult one to love. But now I I feel equipped to love you. Uh, what are you reading right now? So after you preached on Sunday, yeah. at the Garden Church, yeah, and my kids them. heard your jokes, yeah. My daughter said, well, I can tell he's a dad. Hey, she appreciated it. I think she did. There you go. One of them. Uh, what are you reading right now? Oh, uh, right now I'm reading A Theology of the New Testament by Ladd. Yeah, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Care to elaborate? Just, is it good, bad, and uh, different? I'm taking a class in the Gospels, and it's assigned reading, and yeah. it's been useful. It's uh, So uh, he's, I would assume he's dead by now, professor at Fuller Seminary. If he's alive, you're uh, going to feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. He's um, actually like, uh, he's going to be watching this. Comment to the YouTube section, that's right. lad, if you are still that's, alive. It's 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 really useful to kind of get a an assessment of biblical criticism by someone who generally lines up on an evangelical and errantist viewpoint. Okay. Now, okay. Not entirely. But. Yeah. Forget that. <laughs> you are, how old are you? 
46. God, I didn't realize you were 46. You, you Older look young, or younger? You look younger. Oh. You're 46, and you've been a pastor for 15 years? Yep. And you're in seminary. What's up yeah. with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when I became a pastor, my job description assumed that I'd be spending 75% of my job doing admin stuff, yeah. 25% pastoral. And that proved not to be the case. Yeah. Uh, so it's probably flipped. Just the admin stuff wasn't as big and hairy as it looked on the outside. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I didn't really think about going to seminary for a while. After a few years, it hit me. Gosh, my job would really benefit from that education. And eventually, I had a little time. And so I decided to take a seminary class to convince myself that I wouldn't learn anything if I went to seminary. Yeah, who needs it? More yeah. like cemetery, am I right? Yeah, exactly. So I was uh, I was disturbed at how much I learned. <laughs> I learned a lot. And so I decided, okay, I'm just going to take a few seminary classes. And then I kind of kept expanding the categories I wanted to take as I kept getting more good information out of them. Yeah. And so at this point in time, I'm trying to finish my degree. Wow, praise God. How close are you? Uh, it depends on how busy I get. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I could I could finish the next year and a half. Uh, how do you find time to do that? I mean, you, you have small children and not so small children at home. No, teenagers you, now. Yeah, that's right. But you... Um, well, right now I'm on a three-month sabbatical, so I've just tried to cram a bunch of classes in. Well, that's um, restful. So that's been... Well, it is. I mean, being a full-time student is fantastic. You yeah. just didn't realize it. You know, I didn't realize it when I was a full-time yeah. student. So uh, sabbatical time, and then just when it looks like our, we're fully staffed, uh, the church staff, and there's nothing else big going on, I'll try to grab a class or two. Does CHBC allow any time during your work week to, like, you know, take 10 hours I, a week and work yeah, on Yeah, I think the, the general assumption is if I get my work done, I can do what I want with my time. Nice, smart. Which is very generous of them. Very generous, yeah. But, you know, it, you're not taking classes for yourself. You, you know, you're taking it's classes for them, so you and, can better and serve the I church. I see benefit in my pastoral ministry mm. from the classes I take. It's yeah, it's really useful. What's been the most pastorally beneficial class you've taken? Like, oh, man, I really feel like hermeneutics or systematic theology, church history, counseling. Okay, this is, this is not uh, an answer that I would ex have expected before I began seminary. Probably church history. Yeah. Um, just to be able to see the debates that go on in the church today through the lens of history has been really helpful. Yeah, I think it it allows you to have, it allows you to panic less. Yeah, uh, to worry more about things that you should be worried about, and to generally have a nice long term perspective on things. That's good, brother. And the professor I had was wonderfully pastoral in his approach. That also helped. Uh, you're at RTS, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Chad Van Dixhorn, who's now at Westminster. Uh, what a fun name. He's, uh, they're all Dutch, right? All the Presbyterians are yeah. Dutch. Yeah. Dutch or Korean, increasingly. Um, I met him in Hong Kong, actually. Uh, Van Dixhorn? Van Dixhorn, yes. Wow. He and I were both speaking at church retreats. I was at the Chinese uh, Baptist retreat, and it was the same camp as the Chinese Presbyterian retreat that he was speaking at. <laughs> and I happen to know the guy who organized the Chinese Presbyterian retreat, and he introduced me to Chad. Uh, who then later became Dr. Van Dixhorn, as far as I was concerned. You know, it's it's quite an interesting pairing of names. Van Dixhorn sounds very highfalutin. Chad sounds like, uh, you know, uh, what are the, the Kappa Kappa Kappa, what are those guys called? Fraternity. <laughs> Fraternity sounds like, yeah, bro, you know. <laughs> Anyways. You'll probably cut that part out. Nah, people know <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what are your top five? And if you don't have five, that's fine. If you have seven, that's also fine. That's the number of completion in the Bible. Know. You probably learned about that in seminary. Uh, do, you, do, they, do they offer a numerology class? <laughs> Uh, no, no, okay, no. Well, at least not in my seminary. T top five books, just top five books. So here's something you should know, Sean. I'm not a reader. Mm. I know I look, you look like a reader. I look like a reader. <laughs> yeah, I bench like a reader. Yeah, but you're actually like really into like football. No, no, not that okay. No, so I. But you've been a Christian for a I've long time. I've been a Christian time. for a long time, but I'm not the kind of guy. I I read with a purpose. Okay. So I read some. So I I love reading fiction. 
Um, and mm. in terms of Christian stuff, I always have a particular, like I'm reading the book to get this out of it, uh -huh. yeah. which means I have many unfinished books on my bookshelf. Sure. Like I'll get two thirds of the way through. Got like, what I need. I think yeah. I got it. I'm, you know, peace out. Yeah. So, um, and you can include f fiction books if you want. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do Christian books. So top five, uh, Top five that I recommend or top five influential on me? However you want, man. Let me do influential on me. Okay. Um, so the most influential Christian book I ever read was Desiring God by John Piper. Yeah. And it was influential because it was the first Christian book I'd ever read. I was 15. My pastor what? gave it to me. You read it at 15? I did. Did Our, you finish it? I, I Well, yeah, because I was reading it with my pastor. Oh, okay. And it just blew all my concepts. Yeah. Right? You were like, I can actually enjoy God. Wow. <laughs> well, and that that's like a hugely important yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so that was very influential. Another influential one was The Call by Oz Guinness. Oh. Uh, that was especially helpful when I was in the workplace. It's just, it's a theology of work. He's kind of historically yeah. uh, helping understand what was the Protestant era, what was the Roman Catholic era, and what's the what's a biblical view of vocation, yeah. the really doctor of vocation. Gene Veith also wrote a book, God at Work, which is similar. Yeah. It's also very helpful. Um, but very transformative in how I thought about my job. And once I became a pastor, how I thought about pastoring people who have jobs. I appreciate Oz Guinness. I, I can almost never f finish a book by him. I find his prose to be distracting, I guess is what I would oh. say. But uh, Mike, uh, not Mike McKinley, who wrote The Gospel at Work? Um, uh, Sebastian Traeger, Sebastian Greg Gilbert. Sebastian Traeger and Greg Gilbert. That's yes. a good companion book to go with those. Yes. Okay. And I think more accessible. Yeah, that's And right. a lot shorter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else has been really influential on me? I mean, uh, though it was a sermon series that later became a book, uh, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. Mm -hmm. I think that was my first sermon series at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Oh, you're a member there. I was a, I was a member there. Yeah. And yeah, it was just, it was really funny that one of the very first sermons I heard was a topical sermon on expositional preaching. Wow. Yeah. That is funny. Again, blew my category. You know, the first time I read that book, I was, I was just like, eh, cause I, I didn't have, I didn't have the structure for that to make sense. Mm. You know, I was like, yeah, expositional preaching. That's good. Biblical theology. I don't know. Uh, and then when I was a member of CHBC for a year, then after having breathed in the atmosphere, I was like, oh, which is really the value of the internship, right? Mm. You read the books and then you see it in action, mm. right? But yeah, I, I didn't have the depth in me to appreciate how profound, uh, yeah, that was. Mm. Okay, uh, number four. Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ by John Piper. Yeah. Have you read it? Uh, I rarely talk to anybody who knows the book. I, I have read you it. You have? I have. Okay. It was uh, some missionaries that Joan and I support who sent it to us for a Christmas gift. We read it through together. Okay. And I found my affections for Jesus Christ uh, powered through that book in a way I don't think I'd ever had with anything else before. Wow. And again, I think it was kind of the right book at the right time. Uh -huh. But I would say before reading that book, my love for Christ was fairly academic. Mm. Like it was on a ledger. You know, he did all this stuff for me. I did all this stuff to him. Wow, that looks amazing. Yeah. I wouldn't say I had a love for Jesus. Yeah. And something about reading that book just sort of like clicked something in my mind. And I just thought, wow. And so one way Even knew, after you had already read Desiring God. Yes, years yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. Even that was academic. You were like, okay, intellectually now I understand. It makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The category. So, so I think one big difference in my life after reading Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ was the gospels felt alive. Mm. I had always loved the epistles and kind of made my way through the gospels. Like, yeah. oh, it's a bunch of stories about Jesus. Yeah. But the gospels became the, the picture frame through which I saw Jesus. Yeah. And he's, he's amazing. And uh, so, yeah, there's something, something changed my view of scripture there. Um, you know, Piper, he, uh, Kevin Young says, every author really just writes different iterations of the same book. Well, it's certainly true of John Piper. It is most true of John Piper. But uh, he always, you always think he's not going to do it to me again. And then he does. And it's right? so useful every time. And every time. Yes. So like, I just finished a couple months back, Come Lord Jesus, his book on... Um, eschatology. Mm. And I was like, you know, listen, I, John Piper's my hero. I probably don't want to learn eschatology from him, at least not right now. I don't know. And one day I just picked it up in my office in the chapter and I was like, 
He did it again. Because <laughs> the whole book is about like longing for the coming mm. of Christ, right? Like, do you love him so much that you're like, you want him here? Come yeah. now, Lord Jesus. Yeah. And I was like, he did it again, mm. man. So he's uh, infectious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Holiness by J.C. Ryle. That's number four. I don't know what we're on right now. Okay. Um, what did that do for me? I mean, it was in my introduction to Ryle. <laughs> Uh, I, I think Who is eminently readable even today. It's very readable. Um, his chapter in The Thief at the Cross, uh, I think it's called uh, God's Greatest Triumph or something like that. He just, um, he marvels at the faith of the thief on the cross. Yeah. That, you know, even after Jesus was raised from the dead, there were people who wouldn't believe in him. Yeah. But here's a guy hanging on a cross and Another guy looks across at him and says, yes, I believe that you are the son of God. It's like that faith is astounding. Uh -huh, right. And I think it, that, that kind of shaped my view of faith in some really significant ways. Um, totally different category, Canon Revisited by Michael Kruger. That is a very different, I would not have expected that. I have read many books on the inerrancy of scripture over time. It's a, it's a doctrine which has always troubled me. Yeah. Um, because it's not cut and dry, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, what I have here is, uh, at least in his original autographs, the exact inspired inerrant words mm -hmm. of God. Yeah. So I've always believed it, uh, but I have always been a little uncomfortable with kind of what's underneath it. Okay. And I thought Kruger's book was, uh, along with Warfield's, uh, maybe the most helpful I've ever read. And of course, Warfield is just a series of articles, yeah. uh, the inspiration of authority of scripture. Kruger is really kind of holds together and does a really good job of helping you understand what questions you should be asking. Yeah, his, uh, his discussion of like the self-authenticating nature yes. of scripture, Piper actually in his, he has three books on, yeah. on scripture as well. He does the same thing. Yeah. He's like, you know, and it's, with all with all due respect to John Piper, I read Piper's and then I read Kruger's. Yeah. I found Kruger's much more helpful. Well, I mean that's kind of his jam, right? Yeah. Piper's like I want I want you to know this, Kruger. That's what he teaches. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's a that's a very uh, good five. Was there another one? I don't know. I'm sure there's more. If okay. I keep going. Uh, on the J C Ryle holiness, I I got uh, I wanted to get some copies for a bookstall. Mm. And I was very bummed to find that, like, for whatever reason, the only and if if any of our viewers know, like, if I'm wrong about this, please point it out. But I've asked other people, and they found the same thing. The only versions of the book that you can buy now are like big and ugly, and the font is it's like you can't. Oh, that's get, unfortunate. Yeah. So if you know of a, of like a more modern, accessible version of J.C. Ryle's Holiness, link uh, posted in the comments. That you can comments. still buy. Yeah, that you can still buy. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you allowed to have a favorite book of the Bible? It changes all the time. Yeah. What's, what's your, what's your like, man, Ooh, right now it's just, Oh, uh, it's really doing it for me. Uh, let's see. I'm Nahum. I'm always big on Ruth. I just preached through Malachi over the summer mm -hmm. and I loved it. I've always liked Malachi. Is that because you wrote a book on tithing? Uh, I think Malachi is deeply disquoted on tithing. <laughs> um, uh, I love the book of John. Um, so you must have been in a love affair with Romans when you memorized it. Yes, very much yeah. so. And same thing with John. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, so if I had to pick it out, I think it might be Ruth. Yeah. I know there's not as much theological grounding there yeah. as you'll find elsewhere, but just as a, as a, a, a real historical parable of the way God treated his people. Yeah. It's just, it's beautiful. And, yeah. and I particularly am just so struck with God's tender affection for Naomi. Yeah. Like if there's anybody you would think he could just write off and not right. worry about, it's this bitter widow who uh, fled the land in disobedience. And, um, and yet he just sort of surrounds her with his mercy and goodness. Mm to woo her back and then blesses her in ways she didn't even know in her lifetime. Yeah. She couldn't have even ask for that kind of blessing. No. Yeah. And so just, just the, the, uh, the voracious mercy of God that I see in that book is just, I've, I find it captivating. Yeah. You know, the Bible is a living book 
and uh, and and we are living beings. And almost seems like as we enter into different phases of our life, like different parts of the living word speak to us more yeah. powerfully. You know, at this point we need to hear this. At this point we need to hear this. Hopefully we're reading through it regularly, but different parts are always going to jump out at us. Yeah. Last question, maybe the most important question, uh, and it's a two part. Um, uh, what is your least favorite candy and what is your most favorite candy? Now, this is going to reveal a lot about your character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this may actually be undo some of the work we've done to build our friendship. Mm, I mean, most favorites is going to be like those generic orange oh. sugary things. <laughs> Sometimes That's the peach worst. works. <laughs> Wow. I love those things. They don't even have a name because they're yeah, just like. What do you call them? Yeah, I don't know. you get them at like the five and dime. You got to scrape them out of your teeth. Yeah, you got it. Eaten. You got it. And it's just like disgustingly sugary. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the texture. And they're cheap too. You're oh, not going to break you the get bank. get a dollar and give yourself a heart attack. Yeah. Uh, least favorite candy um, anything flavored artificial grape. Oh. I just. I had braces when I was a child and I had this terrible experience. Your teeth aren't that straight. With, they're not, there's a reason for that. I, my orthodontist said I was the worst patient in his entire career. He was like in his 60s at the time. Okay. But they gave me this grape flavoring for the mold thing in my mouth. Uh, I've never forgotten the taste of it. Yeah. And so whenever I guess it reminds me, I just... Childhood trauma. Ugh, exactly. Yeah. Is that why I hate black licorice? Did, so, so there's <laughs> something bad happening to me. I love black licorice. You love black licorice? I do. I do. Oh, man. Well, Are here you, we go. As we said, nothing in common but yeah, Christ. Yeah, right, but Christ. Yes. Because, dude, black licorice. Okay. Do you, would you eat at, uh, would you eat like a, at a Long John Silver's or like a Captain D's? Yeah. Okay. Have I you, haven't in years because there's no nothing anywhere close to me. But Okay, listen. This isn't germane to the topic, but I have to know, who does eat there? That's a good question. Nobody near me. I've never been in a group of people and had someone say, nah, let's not do that. Let's go to Captain D's. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been like, all right, let's go to Long John Silver. Right. When I was growing up, there's a Long John Silver's in our town. And I just thought it looked really cool. And I was always dying to go there. Okay. Yeah. And did you go? I'm sure I did. Yeah. That story was, anti that's the most anticlimactic <laughs> story. And on that note, we will close, brother. Maybe uh, we'll cut that one out. No, no, no. We're no, definitely no, leaving no, it no, in. No. Uh, great interview. Even better. The book is better than the interview for sure. Uh, hopefully certain parts of this interview it's have. It's sad you have to say that. Well, it's because of me. <laughs> My deep inferior. I hate myself. So I'm going to spend the rest of the night thinking about how I screwed up this interview. But thank you for being a part of this, brother. Uh, I hope it whets uh, the appetite of many and that they go and they get a copy. Well, and I'll tell you what, if, if, if there's any good in that book, it's if it, it gets you back into Romans Amen. 12, 13, 14, 15, and you see it in new ways. Because yeah. everybody loves Romans 8. They get, you know, shipwrecked as they get uh -huh. into If they don't get shipwrecked in Romans 9, by the time they're Romans 11, they're like, okay, I'm done with this thing. Yeah, right. And those chapters are important, but there is just gold in the end of the book. Yeah. And I think it's especially important for us today in the church context we're in. Amen. All right, let me pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Uh, help us to meditate on it much. Help us to be overwhelmed by it. Um, help us to move beyond an intellectual grasping of the reality of the mercy we, we've received, but to, to understand it deep down in our hearts, in our, in our bowels, in our bones, mm -hmm. and to be people who reflect that mercy uh, to others. Lord, help our churches. Um, we pray, God, specifically that you'll bless this podcast, um, that anyone who will hear it will be challenged to be merciful in the church, to love others well, mm -hmm. to recognize that they themselves are vessels of mercy, and, and to live like that's true. We pray that you'll bless Jamie's continuing ministry at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, that you will bless his writing, that you'll bless this book. And we ask all of these things in the mighty, glorious, beautiful, holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service 
in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that, if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar to Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially amongst those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. At Ten of Those, we want to serve the local church by equipping your church family with great resources that are going to point them to Jesus. So we'll come and set up a pop-up bookstore in your church. There's no charge. We'll come for your Sunday services. Maybe you've got a, a weekend retreat or a conference. We would love to come and then make recommendations. This is one I've read three times now. It's called Incomparable by Andrew Wilson. And he goes through 60 characteristics of God. It just wonderfully takes our eyes off, off the world, off ourselves, and puts them on our Saviour. Now we've got lots of things for families and, uh, and kids. For parents, I want to recommend this series. This one is Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. Our passion is to get good books that hold the Bible, read by as many people as possible. We handpick our bookstore, it's curated, so we know everything we sell will point to the Lord Jesus. Everything's discounted. And as we make recommendations, we're seeking to serve your church family so that they may be excited and equipped to read good books. And as they do, we'll be praying that it might just change their life.